Now for the veteran members of Congress. Congressman Josh Gottheimer and Tom Reed serve as the co-chairs of the Problem Solvers Caucus in the House, a group of lawmakers committed to reaching across the aisle to tackle the nation's most pressing challenges. The 48 members of the caucus meet weekly to drive working groups on issues such as health care, infrastructure, tax reform, immigration, and border security. We are eager to hear about their vision for the Problem Solvers Caucus going into this new Congress. Please welcome Congressman Josh Gottheimer and Congressman Tom Reed. Bob, over to you. Hey, thanks for joining us. How are you? Bob. Congressman. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Well, congratulations to both of you on winning re-election. Um, so uh, we've been writing about this idea of the uh, Problem Solvers Caucus. And Congressman Reed, why, why, if you could just kind of describe the caucus and, and uh, how big it is and, and what you're trying to do. And of course, we'll get into the, the speaker vote, which is, is very newsworthy. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, Bob. And thanks for uh, all you do uh, with the Hill. And uh, great to be here with my good friend, uh, Josh Gottheimer. Truly is a good friend. And that's not just DC speak. That's sincere. Why do you uh, feel like you have to explain that? Well, because most people <laughs> don't understand. If you, if you explain uh, DC It sounds speak. like I'm not really your good friend when you have to explain. No, 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 he really well, is. Well, because everybody says good friend down here. But, but I do need knows. to interject that you, you both supported each other's re-election. We that did. That is highly unusual. We, we both went to each other's district a, a month or so before the election. Yeah. So we campaigned for Josh and uh, ran ag or campaigned against him in certain areas just to make sure he got re-elected. So whatever worked <laughs> to get him back there. But uh, no, it, it truly is um, something I'm most proud of uh, in my work in Washington, D.C. is the Problem Solvers Caucus. So, uh, we've developed, uh, I think, a unique uh, forum uh, in Washington where 48 of us, 24 Democrats, 24 Republicans, over the last two years essentially got to the point to say enough is enough. Uh, it's time to break this gridlock and get the, the institution working for the American people again. And uh, through Josh's leadership on the Democratic side, I, I will tell you, and us co-chairing on the Republican side, uh, I think we're making a difference. It truly is the only place where there's a culture of trust an honest dialogue. We, we get back at 9 o'clock at night uh, after all of our events and things that, uh, that occur uh, in the evenings there. And we sit together and we talk about the issues. We ask the silly questions. We ask the stupid questions. Uh, we don't play gotcha politics. It's about understanding the policy and seeing where you can find that common ground. And then when we get to that common ground, we vote as a block. And now what we're doing is after learning for two years uh, that we could get to yes on policy, uh, one of the barriers we found were the rules of the House are not designed to reward this kind of behavior. Um, it is actually the rules of the House, the institution is structured in such a way to block this from occurring. And so now we're in the middle of a battle and Josh is doing a great job with the new speaker coming uh, in on the Democratic side to use this opportunity to reform the rules to get it functioning again with bipartisan legislation. Members can be members and start to legislate for the American people. So I'm very optimistic of where we stand and very grateful uh, to have uh, Josh uh, w as a partner uh, in this effort. Well, one of my questions, Congressman Gottheimer, was to ask you, when are you going to meet with uh, Nancy Pelosi? And then I saw Nancy Pelosi's office put out a statement that you, already, you had a meeting. Was yesterday. it yesterday? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, just as a little bit of background, you guys, before the election, said, listen, we want these reforms to the how the House operates. We, we want to not run like a dictatorship, which really both parties have run the House like a dictatorship, mm -hmm. um, and, and open it up so that there can be more bipartisanship. And unless those rules, and you've proposed rules changes, right. are accepted, then you can't get my vote for speaker. So how did the meeting go, and where do you go from here? Well, take it back one step, Bob, uh -huh. thanks for having us. Um, and um, and it's real. It really is nice to spend time with Tom. You will see quickly that we get along really well and speak every day. Um, and uh, my wife is jealous. <laughs> and um, uh, but we, we do we speak every day. And and we actually do what you're supposed to do, which is try to figure out where where the eighty percent solutions are. Which is you know you, you it's very easy to disagree and say well, you're against. It's much harder to figure out if you can find a place to to get together. We've done it on some of the toughest issues, right? On we, we actually got to 75% of us agreeing, which is what you need to, what we need to get to in our bylaws to, to agree to take a position or vote on a piece of legislation together as a block. And we were able to do it on health care, on immigration reform, on gun safety and school safety. Um, we, we got successes on 
on school safety and uh, we got successes on prison reform and help stop one of the shutdowns and um, and on controlled, opioids and controlled uh, substances right controlled substances right so so we've we've had good successes and then we what we learned from this whole process is we would get to these we'd get legislation that we saw vast bipartisan support for um, and that we knew if we could get to two, we could get 218 votes which is what you need on the house floor but you couldn't get the bill to the house floor to vote and uh, mind-numbingly frustrating and as a new member of congress i couldn't understand the fact that wait you could actually get bipartisan support for something have the 218 votes off the floor, but then no one will actually let you debate it or vote on it on the floor. That seems ridiculous, and I didn't understand that before I was a member of Congress. So the, the rules package we put together, which we call Break the Gridlock, um, are a set of rules that would help change that, would encourage more bipartisan, that when you got bipartisan legislation, you actually could get it to the floor for a vote. And this is about empowering members who right we all get elected in our districts around the country and you think and and we should everything shouldn't be leadership telling you what you can do there should be some you know bottoms up and the committee should have power again and people should be able to do business the way it used to be done so this proposal we did you know really tries to get at that and what we said as Bob was saying we said to anybody who wants to be speaker of the house we will not be supporting that speaker unless you support these rules reforms or if you come up with an idea that gets the same purpose um, and uh, so yesterday we did meet with uh, Leader Pelosi who said she is running for speaker and we'll meet with anybody who uh, raises their hand uh, so that, that's where we are yesterday we had a very productive conversation went through each of the proposed rules um, agreed on some there were some ideas on how to make them better um, and now uh, where we are is uh, we're waiting to see uh, in writing the, sub the specifics uh, in terms of what Leader Pelosi um, and uh, Ranking Member McGovern are willing to support in our caucus and then on the House floor. So the meeting yesterday, w was it just Democrats? Just the Democrats. Okay. Uh, okay. The, just the Democrats in, in the Problem Solvers Caucus. But you came away optimistic that th there are going to be, because remember the rules changes have to be adopted at the beginning of Congress just like the Speaker has. Correct. Yes. So do you think that uh, there's, they are genuinely going to accept some of your recommendations and that you would end up supporting Leader Pelosi because right now there's no other candidate in the, in the race. Well, I'll say this. I thought it was a very productive session. We really engaged line by line on what we proposed. Um, that was, I thought, you know, an excellent outcome. Even on some of the issues, you know, there were some tough things there that are all about empowering uh, rank, you know, the rank and file member, mm -hmm. and um, and she was supportive. We've got to see ultimately the package that she's in writing of what uh, of what she's willing to support, and you know, and who else? We've got we've got time between now and and January, so you know, uh, it's it's uh, really got to see what and who is behind the package. You know, how many how many Democrats? And so does Tom, by the way. Because you know that we we've both said the same thing. We're only willing to support somebody who who does it. With, with the elections, what is your number at now? With candidates coming in, what 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 is how big is the the caucus going to be in the new Congress? Well, the caucus. I mean, the majority is going to probably be somewhere between the, the, the twelve to fourteen is what the numbers look to look to be. Um, and so, what the caucus uh, where we're at is we're probably going to be at that same forty eight uh, plus or minus uh, number. Okay. Uh, but it's not necessarily about that number per se. And I often talk to folks about it. It's about making sure that these members are a mile deep in their commitments to each other. This is not a caucus where you just can sh show up and put it on your resume and you're part of it. You have to go be invited to this caucus. You have to recognize our bylaws. You have to uh, personally commit to this, personally commit to members, uh, eyeball to eyeball. And that still means something in Washington, D.C. as a member. You give your word. And if you breach that word, you're not going to be uh, a member of, uh, an effective member, at least uh, here in Washington. And so. And you can't campaign like what you just You can't campaign against each other. You it's a big can't thing. Uh, write a check against a uh, one of the opponents uh, of a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus. And so we're trying to change that culture, adopting some of these. Uh, more civil type of uh, respect and recognition of each other. And so what we're going to be, and so that majority number is the critical number. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're at 12, 14, and we got, you know, 24 uh, Republicans who are willing to make this commitment and cross over, and when we can get to that consensus, I think we become, uh, in my humble opinion, the governing block uh, of Washington, D.C. Uh, because uh, we went through, I went through, I've been here since 2010, I went through the Tea Party movement, I went through the Freedom Caucus evolution, and I will tell you, I see some of that occurring uh, on the left as we speak. And so there's going to still have to be a group of members that want to get to 218 that aren't going to shut the government down, are not going to default on our debt ceiling, 
still have to legislate on things like infrastructure and health care, willing to maybe not take on uh, a whole comprehensive package on some of these issues, but marginally take, thing, take care of things like the individual marketplace under the Affordable Care Act as it collapses and premiums go through the roof. So there are opportunities that I think this group are going to seize upon and be that working governing majority uh, that works with the other side to keep the lights on here in Washington, D.C. And in, as I mentioned, the, the speaker vote is going to be the first vote for certainly the, the new members and uh, the mem all members of, of the House uh, next year. But I want to get this straight. So let's say uh, Leader Pelosi, uh, in her effort to become speaker, gives, gives you guys a lot and says, okay, I'll agree to most of these rules, maybe tweak it here or there. Would you support Nancy Pelosi for speaker? Yeah, so this has got some attention. As a Republican <laughs> member, and this is the bizarre world, and I am all in on this because this gridlock has to break. And I said I would be willing, as a Republican on the Florida House, to support a speaker candidate, including Nancy Pelosi, who supports these rule reforms. It is time for this city to, to change for the American people. And this gridlock, this governing by extremism on the hard left and the hard right has to come to an end. And so that's where uh, I've been willing to go even uh, further than some of my colleagues. And I will tell you, it's that's got a big some deal. attention. And uh, <laughs> yes, it's, uh, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. Um, but I will tell you, it, it's, it's how firmly committed I am to this. And if they're sincere about any candidate on the other side, if they're sincere, and that's why I so appreciate Josh making sure that we get this in writing. Uh, we do these negotiations. We put the Break the Gridlock package out there months ago so we don't jam anybody. Uh, we've had thorough discussion of these proposals. And when we get to the finish line, uh, I'm just very confident that there's going to be a new way of doing business here in Washington. Well, this is remarkable <laughs> that it, Republicans could, could vote for, for Nancy Pelosi. I mean, have you had, uh, I, won't, I won't ask you to name names, but some in the problem solvers got to say, Congressman Reed, you know, I don't know about this. I, I can't, uh, you know, it's going to be used against me in, of course. in, in the campaign ad. Yeah, and, and obviously it's, it's not, uh, I speak for myself. Right. And there are other members, though, that are as committed as I am to this on the Republican side uh, that are willing to do that. But, uh, and I'll let them address it individually. Uh, but I think it shows you the voice of Congress, the silent voice of members that are saying enough is enough. We came here to legislate, and I will tell you, when you have to, when you get 350 uh, co-sponsorships on a bill, and because leadership says, no, we don't want to do it, or you got members who co-sponsor legislation, tell that little interest that, uh, you know, I, I co-sponsored your bill, but, uh, and then they go to our leadership and go, but don't ever make me vote on it. Don't ever make me go bring it to the floor so that I have to go on record on it. That type of shenanigans, that type of uh, lack of courage uh, in uh, leadership, in my opinion, has to come to an end. And that's why we are at a pivotal moment where we have an opportunity with a new speaker candidate coming in to change this institution. And, and that's the big deal, right? I mean, we, wanna, we really want to govern again. And that's what you're hearing and what, where, where we really came up in the last couple of years is we've been focused on how do we change the way things are because the way things are aren't acceptable. The fact that you can't govern, the fact that you have broad bipartisan support and you can't bring it to the floor, that the extremists control things. And by the way, both sides have them, the extremists. And, and you know, the idea here is that we've got to find that common sense middle where we can get together and actually govern around legislate and legislate again. And I think that's what the, we, we hear it at home. And I, we've talked to every member and you know who's involved in the caucus and when, who walked around with these rules changes and they all said the same thing. Yeah, people want us to, to actually work together and get something done. Did this come up in the meeting yesterday that you said, I, I actually can bring Republicans who can vote for you, Leader Pelosi, and do they believe it? Well, of course, I'm not going to divulge all my conversations. Um, <laughs> uh, but but no, we, we talked about the rules changes yesterday. OK. OK. Um, all right, so Congressman Reed, um, what are the areas that you see uh, now with divided government in the new year? What can be done? Transportation is something mentioned, criminal justice reform, those things, anything else? Yeah, no, I, I think there is some appetite. Uh, obviously, infrastructure, I think, is the big issue. Uh, that I think uh, many of us would be willing to uh, get to that hard answer and get to a solution on that issue, and that would be huge. Uh, America needs it. As a former mayor, uh, I know uh, the state of our infrastructure across America, and, and to get a solution to this in a way that addresses it to a trillion dollar type of level of investment is huge. Um, you, you got health care issues on the margins in regards to some things we can do on drug pricing, I think, is mm -hmm. an opportunity for us to uh, uh, deal with some issues. And I heard some panel, the, the prior panels of some uh, members yep. coming in on the other side that uh, I, agree, I would agree with that assessment. And I would agree that there's, uh, you know, just fundamental governing uh, that has to occur. And, um, and there's going to be reforms. This national debt crisis that I am very deeply concerned about, we have to get on trajectory to start getting this spending and fiscal house in order. So there are some things there that I think we can do too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, why don't we go to questions, if you can raise your hand, and then just wait for uh, Mike to get to you, and then just identify yourself. Uh, good morning. Uh, Dan Durack with the Partnership for Public Service. Just wondering if any uh, bipartisan oversight priorities that you see coming up in the 116th. Thanks. Oversight. Well, I think it's going to be the responsibility as it is, as it's our constitutional responsibility to do our job and make sure that we you know, watch over watch over the executive branch and, and, and make sure that they do their job. Um, I think it's very important, as Tom said, as we're doing that, to make to focus on other issues as well. As Tom said, Im, you know, infrastructure, Medicine immigration and reform, health care. Right there's uh, there's transportation issues. More uh, I think more on of course the opioid crisis. There's a, a, a there are a series of issues where I think you can find good bipartisan support for and that we should be working together on. So and I, and I think uh, the the question you, you pose is going to be a fundamental question I th I see from my position looking at uh, observing the majority is is it going to be investigate or legislate? And if it's investigate for good faith oversight that we should be exercising as members of Congress, being that co-equal uh, branch of government, I think you'll see uh, folks working together to get that done. But if it turns into just to investigate for the purposes of setting up a 2020 presidential run uh, for whoever's running, um, there's a large list obviously that's developing, uh, that could be a problem. And, and who loses in that, and where I get frustrated, is the American people. You lose two years, if that's the path that uh, uh, we go down over the next two years. The American people get lost in the shuffle, and uh, and that is so frustrating. So good faith investigation oversight. I think there there could be uh, workings together to do that. And, and I'm, I just add to that. Uh, I, I agree with Tom. And I, to add to that, you know, I'm I was concerned after the leadership elections yesterday, and on the other side, it was immediately they came out hard swinging uh, instead of about all these different issues attacking, instead of saying, okay, let's figure out where we can work together. And I would hope that that was just for a day-long camera, you know, for the cameras for an hour and not for actually the intended approach. Because I think both sides are going to really have to sit down and work together. And it can't just be our side and it can't just be their side. And this is the whole idea. We both have to talk to one another. We both have to sit down with each other. You know, uh, and, and that's the thing I think we've really learned is when you spend time, when you talk to one another, and when you, more importantly, when you listen to one another and understand actually what the other's priorities are or how to talk about them or what's important, that's when you, act, when you can find a solution together. You're not going to get everything you want. But you have to be willing to not get everything you want. I think if we go in saying, hey, we don't want 100% or nothing, or if we take an obstructionist approach, um, just like, frankly, you know, we've been facing in the last years, um, that to me will be a recipe for failure for, for, for this Congress. But you can have a re you, if you do it differently, it can be very successful for the American people, right? Not, you know, because we're supposed to put country first before any political party. And I think that should be our objective. Devin Nielsen, I'm from uh, American University, and um, I was wondering, would you be able to speak to um, any adversity that you have both faced uh, advocating for bipartisanship in general and supporting each other's campaigns? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> yes. Um, what, what we're doing, I mean, just to be, uh, be clear, I mean, uh, Josh was our top target uh, in regards to the Republican target list in the beginning of the session. So when, when we first came out and we developed this friendship and this relationship, um, I will tell you that there were political operatives in this town that immediately came uh, to me and said, what are you doing? Why are you empowering him to stay here? And what I point blank said to them is, uh, he's a good man. And that's what we need here. And uh, we need more of them. And they're like, well, then we're not going to support you here, here, here. We're going to you know, do some things. And I'm like, look, it, I, 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 I can take care of myself. I believe in good policy makes good politics and if you do the right thing as my mentor John Boehner said if you do the right things at the right time each and every time the right thing will happen and so what we're continuing to do is that but I will tell you you know yeah, discussions of I'm on ways and means I've been there since 2011 it's a great committee there's been discussions of okay we're going to take that committee uh, assignment away from you that type of thing and I'm just like look at if you want to do that that's fine but I'm not going to go down without a fight and what I've what I've noticed is most members and even leadership and people that are in that position who try to do that recognize that because the country is so demanding this type of leadership uh, that it would be a battle that they don't want to engage in and what they're doing is backing away and saying okay let's see what happens as this thing develops and most of them say you're tilting at windmills anyway 
um, the cynics in them come out and at the end of the day, well, we don't have to do anything because you're not going to be successful to begin with. Mm -hmm. And you've heard it. You've been around sure. this town for years, and I've heard sure. that too. And I said, well, fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, and adding to that, there, there are plenty of people in this town who represent the more extreme side of, of things, right, on both sides. And, and that's been the biggest, and, and by the way, at home too. And so that's been, uh, that's where I faced the biggest issues. But actually, the majority of people that you speak to, as Tom was saying, here and, and back at home, and uh, say, come up to me and say, hey, I, I'm a Republican, they'll say, right? It's personal say, but, but I'm supporting you because I like the way you're trying to actually govern, right? That you're actually trying to work across the aisle to get things done. And wow, that's, that's a, a refreshing way to do things. And I know it's not easy, and I know it's tough, and you, you face your challenges, right? People, people go after you, but this is what we need. And um, I believe that's our job, and so the naysayers, let them say what they want to say. Because um, I, I think what we're doing is we've, we've got to change. This, this just can't go on the way it's been going on. And there's a reason why so many people have lost faith in, in their institutions here, because we're, we're not giving them enough reason change your mind. And what we're trying to do is actually show them that we can do things differently. And I think that's the key. And I would just end, I think what we're trying to do here is demonstrate we're trying to uh, listen to the voice of the silent, uh, the silent majority, doing the hard work of listening to the silent majority as opposed to just pacifying the loud voices and shouts of the, of the extremes. Yeah, well, we've been reporting on your effort for months. And when I first heard the idea of using the speaker vote as leverage, I thought, that is genius. And I do think this is going to get a lot of attention. Obviously, the speaker vote is not until January, but this is a big deal. Anyway, please thank uh, the Congressman for thank joining us this morning. I hand it back to Jack.